Yeah, this talk today um, came about, well, it's about two guys, but one in particular. But just to a straw poll, I guess um, many of you have heard of uh, Douglas Mawson, I guess. Hands up, Douglas Mawson. Well known, isn't he? Particularly if you go to South Australia, everywhere you go, you come across Mawson. And what about George, George Wilkins? Everyone familiar with George? Yeah, usually a lot less, but I guess in this gathering, I can understand that George would be better known than the most groups if you take a poll of people. And, and George is the guy that mainly I would like to talk about more. Although I originally did this as a comparison between the two because they're really quite different characters, different backgrounds, different careers. They were contemporary, they lived at the same time, about the same age, and uh, very, very different characters and different approach to their, to their life. So, I could say they're both passionate and both attracted to the polar region. That's where the attraction was, getting to the polar regions. Uh, Mawson, in the case, his case was pretty much Antarctica. Uh, originally, uh, Wilkins, that was his plan too, but it didn't always work out that way. A lot of events took, uh, took over from him, uh, historic events that really changed what he did. Again, they both did, uh, both travelled with Shackleton, by the way, and uh, Mawson, as an educated uh, professor of geology, he was, a, he was the leader of the scientific team uh, in the first expedition, that was the Nimrod, and then later Shackleton's last expedition, you might recall it, that was the last one where he died, and uh, Morse, uh, Wilkins was the senior uh, scientist on that expedition, but with no qualifications whatsoever except what he'd learned through his life. So quite extraordinary. So yeah, Mawson, um, UK born, Sydney University educated. Wilkins, the farm boy from South Australia. I want to spend most of my time speaking about him. And he was, um, he grew up at that time, uh, the Federation drought was absolutely devastating in, uh, in that southern part of Australia, southeast of Australia. And he experienced that with his family. And he figured as a young guy that there must be a, a way of predicting the weather. And one way of doing this was studying the polar regions, setting up weather stations, and perhaps then predicting long term what the weather is likely to be. As I say, he was a life educated sort of guy. He, he didn't take very kindly to classroom education, although he was a voracious reader. He absorbed all sorts of information wherever he could get. And Anything new, he was on to it, no worries. The classroom, not so much. And getting qualifications, no. Nah. Hey teacher, leave those kids alone. I've highlighted those last three because his photography was really the, the reason why I've got so much about him, the records about him. Um, and then when he was um, asked on his AOF, he tried to join the army and uh, for the First World War, he put down as, he, as his uh, occupation explorer. So that's how he described himself. Um, but of course he was an aviator, a very good one. But more than that, he was a good navigator. And so I think a lot of his aviation experience um, was successful because of his navigation. The, fl the flying was the easy part for him. But the navigation is another story, as many of you probably appreciate. So going back to some of his background, as I said, he's a farm boy from South Australia, and he, um, this place where he grew up, Mount Bryan, was uh, right on the borderline of the farming where, where you could farm where you couldn't. And there was a, a line drawn they called the Goida Line. So they said that north of that line you should not be farming. And when the Federation drought came along, a lot of people really figured that was very true. And of course they abandoned the farms. And the evidence is still there, isn't it, when you drive, drive through that up north of South Australia, seeing those um, abandoned farmhouses. And Dick Smith got hold of this information back in about 2000, and he put the money up to restore the cottage then and there's a shop there of the cottage. Uh, and uh, so he was, it was Louisa and Harry, his parents. They um, 
um, obviously found it very difficult. And he experienced having to pull sheep out of the bog and try and save the flock. And terrible time as a young kid. Uh, his parents sort of desperate. And, and Louisa, he, he was actually the, the last of Louisa's 13 children. <laughs> so he certainly had a big family. <laughs> and uh, of course they had to move to Adelaide uh, and just abandon the farm really. But he was a man of action. He quickly got involved, <clears throat> involved in anything new. And of course things new at the time were flying, cars were all the go, and the cinema. So he got involved in tent cinemas, they were uh, being put up everywhere. Uh, Sydney at the time was a bit of a hub for photography and for cinema. And Australia, in fact, in those days was a leader in um, cinematography. But he got stuck into that. But in the meantime, he also went to um, the School of Mines in Adelaide, but not for long. He felt he got the hang of it, so moved on. He went to the Conservatorium of Music, he loved music, but he didn't qualify in anything, of course. And he did a number of other things, just learning as, as he went. So, Adelaide got a bit small for young George. He moved on to Sydney. Um, he probably could have paid for his fare, but he didn't see any point of doing that. So he jumped on a ship and um, got his way to Sydney. Uh, not sure if he actually got kicked off or he chose to leave, but he... Um, he got as far as Sydney, staying away, and spent us quite a number of months there racing around filming. He'd film anything that was action, like horse races, car races, any trains, any big movement, he'd, he'd go out and film it. And he made a name for himself so that in London, this guy, who is this guy? And uh, it was the Gamont Film Company in uh, London, they had a Paris base and a London base. I said, get over here, you know, we need you. But you just have to find your own way. Fair enough. He knows how to get there, doesn't he? Jumps on a ship. And uh, he gets as far as Algiers. And it's not clear from the records whether he was kicked off there or whether he just jumped off and made his own way overland to London. Whichever way it happened, uh, he got to London as a 21-year-old. And there he of course, got involved in flying. The Hendon Flying School was running there with uh, Claude Graham White. He was uh, actually giving out licences and training flyers, as many of you may be aware. And then, um, Wilkins come up to this guy and um, he'd heard about Graham White, um, White and he said, is this guy that top hats himself a bit? They call him Graham White or something, you, you know? Uh, <coughs> that is me. <laughs> so, a bit embarrassing, but he had a good sense of humour, so took him up and gave him a flight. And of course, that was it for, for Wilkins, he was a flyer. Um, he did a few lessons, but didn't see a need to get a pilot's licence. Um, and he, he never did, apparently, he never, never had a licence. He got in pretty proficient at it and uh, uh, didn't as you say, didn't want to have a qualification, didn't need it. Uh, yeah, he did take battle photos in, in the Crimea, not the Crimea, but the Balkans War, because Gamont Film Company, they wanted him to carry on with his dramatic filming, his cinematography was all the go. They wanted a lot of action pictures, and wartime was a lot of action. So he was sent over there on the Turkish side to get film and pictures of, of the war from the Turkish point of view. And he did that, and uh, was written up by this guy, Bernard Grant, uh, rather liked him, a pretty good companion. And this was one of the aircraft, uh, it seems that Turkey bought two of these aircraft, these Bristol Priors, um, pretty ungainly looking things I guess, but uh, at the time, as you know, there was a lot of air races and uh, competition to see who could fly the fastest and the furthest and build the best plane. And, and these, these planes were modified um, for, for the um, military use. And it's quite amusing, I find this, all the letters on that are like instructions of this is the fuselage, this is the this, this is that. 
But um, anyway, that's what they did. And I noticed the skis there, uh, as well as the wheels, like as a, as a bit of a help for the landing. Uh, and the story goes, as he tells it, that he got over to um, this war area, and uh, a lot of other journalists were there as well. And they all liked to be in the hotel and you know, chat about their stories and try and get the best news. But not Wilkins, he, he wanted to get out there. So he talked to a Turkish pilot and to take him up. And there's a 50 50 chance this is the one because Turkey only bought two of these and this is one of them. So it could be that Wilkins went up in this one. Okay. So, uh, and when he did get up there, um, Wilkins taught the Turkish pilot and to let him to take over the controls. And uh, apparently he must have been a good talker because that's what he did. Then he proceeded to fly out over the enemy lines and over the battlefield. And the poor Turkish pilot was having conniptions about this. And they actually physically fought over the controls. Uh, Wilkins trying to get over the battle lines to get some pictures. So, yeah, it's um, quite a story. So anyway, we get off to the Arctic now. We've got um, a period of time when he was always wanting to get to the Arctic. And Stephenson was a Canadian explorer who, uh, he was an adventurer type of explorer. He just wanted to um, get his name known, had plenty of money. But he was completely disorganised. He got a whole crew together, a uh, very big group of guys, about 17 of them died in the process. Uh, and Wilkins there, and very soon the, the crew looked to Wilkins for leadership because Stephenson was pretty hopeless, and uh, ended up spending about three years up there. And there he is with his camera gear, uh, with a Gamon uh, label on there. <coughs> you know, Wilkins had spent a lot of time with Aboriginal people in Australia in that period as a kid. He lived with them for a while. He hunted with them, he learnt their culture, and he was quite comfortable with the Inuit people as well. They, um, they appreciated what he could do, and um, they looked up to him for many things, and he learnt many, many skills there. They loved his photography, and they called him Anakuta, the, the, um, the strong, wise man of the, um, of the Inuit. He had to rescue Stephenson, um, as I say, a lot of them died in that, that period. So wartime comes along and it took quite a while because in 1916 he was leaving Antarctica and found out, oh, there's a war on. <laughs> and also at that time his father died, so he came back to Australia and uh, eventually got to London. He, he applied to the AIF to join. He wanted to be a flyer in the, in the, in the, in the contest, but he was apparently colourblind, and um, so he couldn't do that, so he was a photographer, a wartime photographer. And Charles Bean um, appreciated his work, and he, uh, Charles Bean had uh, Wilkins and uh, Early, and they, they were the main team that Bean had to record the, the, war, the war effort. So here he is um, finding a vantage point for a shot. We're not sure if that, that's actually um, Hurley at all, but this is, this is Wilkins. Um, some, some reports say that's Hurley, but I, I, when you compare pictures of Hurley, it doesn't look like him. And others have said it's one of the sergeants that worked with him. But anyway, Hurley and Wilkins did work together, and Bean appreciated the work of Wilkins because of his, his, um, his eye for the, for the picture and his framing and also for getting the actual picture of what was going on. Whereas Hurley had developed this technique of um, collaborating and getting photos composite to tell a story. So he'd take three or four shots of different actions, compile them into a one image to tell a story. And Bean hated that, he didn't want to do that. So they had a bit of a uh, fracas about that and uh, Bean always preferred Wilkins for his photographic work. He took lots of uh, photographs, there's heaps of them in the Australian War uh, Memorial and a lot, lot of them in the Canadian and, um, 
American museums and the Bird Polar Observatory. I've got a lot of his collections over there. He took lots of shots going over the top. He's wounded and awarded MC. He got the military cross twice, by the way. And he's the only photographer uh, ever to win a combat medal, as far as we know. And he never carried a rifle in. When he's in the field, he never carried a rifle in his camera. And Monash, is, in his memoirs, called him the bravest man I've ever met. A lot of those photos from the Passion Day on post-war doing the um, reporting at Gallipoli, uh, just, just recording, recording, recording. Anyway, back to the air. Uh, Billy Hughes in 1919 said, we've got to get uh, these guys flying from London to Australia. Here's 10,000 pounds Australia. A lot of money then, eh? 10,000 pounds um, in 1919. And of course, Wilkins was up for that. He got a crew together and he got this ugly looking old Blackburn kangaroo. Uh, one of the Leeds uh, builders built these bombers, and uh, there's a picture of it there. Uh, not looking very happy. <laughs> but these were built as bombers uh, towards the end of the war, but never actually used much as a bomber, a twin engine by. But um, here it is um, crashing in Crete. Because they took off um, a bit late, they had all sorts of problems cobbling things together. Uh, the crew was um, not that experienced anyway, and um, they hopped over France and eventually ended up in Crete. But actually on the way over through France on one occasion, they had to come down to um, attend to some engine problems, and they landed on a strip and made the guys aware they were coming in. <laughs> and they came in a bit fast and uh, overshot the runway, and the braking system was pretty inadequate and they bumped across the end of the runway and there was a hangar at the end of the runway. And these guys, the plane just went straight through the open doors of the hangar and it pulled up within metres of the back wall. Extraordinary. And, uh, and the guys being nonchalant sort of Australian, they said, oh, we do this all the time, you know. <laughs> so, saves mucking about. Yeah. And the British papers had a, a ball with this photo because um, they've always been giving these crazy flyers a hard time being maniacs. And uh, this particular photo is taken at the boundary at in Crete, a lunatic asylum. <laughs> so, so the British press had a field day with that photo. They hopped into Crete instead of Sydney. Of course, the Smith brothers, that, of course, won that. But they left about five weeks before these guys left and they thought they were going to win, but uh, the Smith brothers, of course, uh, did it in there. Uh, in the Vinny, wasn't it? They used the Vinny? Yeah. So then he gets to um, another scientific expedition. This is the um, Shackleton's last quest one. And as I say before, the, um, the last one was where he was the senior scientist advisor. <clears throat> Mawson having been the scientific advisor on the first expedition. Uh, Wilkins is not in this photo, he took the photo of the, the crew at the memorial they built for Shackleton on South Georgia. So moving on, um, every year there's something happening because he's recorded so much stuff, not only in photograph and, and film, but his diaries and his records. <clears throat> and he'd done a survey in Russia just after the war, the 2021 period, the early period of the Soviet era. And um, the British Museum wanted to do this recording because um, everyone was keen to know what's going on in Russia. They had a terrible uh, drought and um, there's still a lot of unrest, of course. And his records there impressed the British Museum. And they said, well, you better do this in Australia, which he did in a couple of years in 23, 25. With his Aboriginal companion, they traipsed over lots of northern Australia collecting and recording uh, plants, animals, um, Aboriginal cultural uh, artefacts and so on. And he, he recognised, as did the British Museum, that a lot of our culture, our plants and um, native species were being wiped out. And uh, the British Museum couldn't understand why Australians were so complacent about this. So he recorded that and published in the, this book, The Undiscovered Australia, 
and uh, th this made him pretty much persona non grata in Australia because um, one of the quotes from the book said that this is the poorest rich country on earth. So from then on, there was not much favourable press coverage for Wilkins in Australia. So he got back to the Arctic, and this is where he, um, in 1925, he planned a, a trip across the pole. So he reckoned this must be able to be possibly possible to be done. We just got to figure out how to do it. So he talks it to the Detroit car manufacturers and uh, gets some money together for a couple of Fokkers. This is the Alaskan, a single engine, a uh, 72 foot one. And, and another one, he had a tri-motor. This was the uh, inline six on this one, and um, a single engine. Uh, I think about the first day out, they crashed it. And they had a lot of trouble, mainly undercarriages, that was the main thing they had a problem. They also had this uh, tri-motor, the Fokker tri-motor, was a similar sort of aircraft, with the whirlwind engines. There it is, so the Detroit Arctic Expedition. And he um, experimented with that one as well. Again, this, this is showing with the wheels on, but they switched that across to, uh, to skis. And one of the ski, um, I think these are the wooden skis, and the whole thing's turned over and uh, crashed. And uh, again, another, you know, you see that it's just a minor setback. This, now we'll move on, we'll just learn from that. It's another learning experience. So there's the Alaskan. They fixed it up again and uh, put some metal skis on it and uh, had another go. This time with the Detroit News because the, after a while the, uh, the, the car manufacturer guys like Ford and all these mates in Detroit got a bit sick of forking out all this extra money and the Detroit News then stepped in and paid uh, and supported him. There is the Detroit um, in the, on the ground again, and uh, there's some discussion about which which uh, plane it was that Kingsford Smith took over, because uh, Wilkins sold uh, sold this aircraft to Kingsford Smith, and Kingsford Smith then uh, renamed it the Southern Cross. Obviously, put two motors, put some new motors on it, but um, it's essentially the same aircraft. Um, the wing, we don't know which wing it was, but you know, it could have been, could have been one or the other, because the Fokker um, Alaskan had its wing broken. But they did experiment changing the wings around, changing things over, um, and ski gear, different types of ski gear, all, all the time. So it was a real learning experience. Some of the, the motor of the Detroit. So that. Wasn't going to be beaten by that. That was a minor setback. He next year went out with some Stimsons biplanes, and with his good mate Ben Nielsen, who was a top American flyer, they worked together. And here's one of the, um, the, the Stimson. It's got the J4 rights because the, the Wright brothers had this manufacturing company uh, making motors, and the J4 was in this. And um, Wilkins ended up saying, we begged for money, we bought machines, flew them, smashed them, rebuilt them, smashed ourselves. <laughs> so, uh, he, he carried on. So, they, they did a lot of experimenting on different landings, because landing on ice, uh, they're very unpredictable. It might be powder snow on there, it might be ice ridges, it might be ice, glass, you know, all sorts of conditions. And, um, fortunately, Wilkins is having spent so much time in the Arctic, the Inuit, he read the ice pretty well, and so uh, it made a big difference about how he designed the skis and how he learnt to land on, on those conditions. But while he was out um, doing these surveys, he was also interested in anything else that was going, he would collect data. So he, one of the things was they didn't know if there was land out there at that time. It could have been another, another continent, but he did depth soundings out there at 5,600 metres. So oh, there's no land here, boys. <laughs> Pretty sure it's all water. And so they did engine repairs on the ice, and one of the things that Ben Eelson suffered from badly was frostbite, and he lost a couple of fingers, had them amputated because of that. Because they had to, as the plane came down, they had to work on the motor at 30 degrees below, and uh, 
you know, there's pretty hard conditions to work on a motor like that. But Wilton seemed to be very um, resilient to cold and he didn't seem to suffer the same way. And Ben does accredit Wilkins with his survival. The following year, because um, the sale of that uh, aircraft to Kingsford Smith allowed him to buy uh, this Lockheed Vega. And notice how things have changed in a short time. Well, it looks like a more, much more modern sort of style, this little aircraft, the Lockheed Vega. Um, and it's, it's a monocoque moulded plywood sort of, sort of fuselage, quite different. No struts and wires anymore, they got rid of that. It's all cantilevered now. And um, this had the, the J5, the upgraded whirlwind, and um, the radial. So he loved this. He, as, soon as, as soon as Wilkins saw this plane, he said, that's the one. That's the one. So a yeah, two-bladed prop there. So there it is. I think this one seems to have this, the metal spears on it. Um, I think he preferred the wooden ones, but um, looks like metal on that one. So uh, this is April 1928, we are now, and they actually flew from Point Barrow in Alaska across to Spitz, Spitzbergen in Norway. So that was the first time that there'd been a flight across the pole. So he, he finally did it. Only three years, or only four, and there you go. So because that created a huge uh, thing around the world, it was such a big deal, and uh, particularly in New York, um, they said greatest flight in history, and uh, there you go, a map there showing Barrow to Spitzbergen. I see Ben there is holding his hand behind him, I think that, that's the one that he lost his fingers on, he probably doesn't want it. So there were accolades all around him, this huge thing, they got, Amundsen was still alive at the time, he, he and Nansen, the great explorers, said it's a great thing to do. Uh, Fifteen scientific bodies, the heroes welcome all over Europe, and in, in London he was knighted. And this is where he became Sir Hubert, because when he had actually been ten years before when Monash was um, knighted in the field, when George V came out and knighted uh, Monash, uh, Wilkins was there to take the photograph. And ten years later, here he is, <laughs> and he said, oh, I better not call myself George, you know, it's not, doesn't seem right that King George should be calling me Sir George. Uh, let's make it Hubert. So he became Sir Hubert. In Australia, there's not much uh, excitement at all. It was reported, and one of the newspaper reporters uh, asked for a comment from, from Douglas Mawson. And uh, so, uh, amateur adventurer. <laughs> that, that, that's sort of typical of that. You know, the academia world have been disparaging about people that don't have academic qualifications. It's so true anywhere, isn't it, that the self-taught is not given the recognition, uh, particularly by people that feel that they should be the experts. So beware the expert. And of course, Morse did follow in his footsteps using aircraft uh, later on in, in Antarctica. Okay, because a lot to his life, and um, I'm focusing here more on the flying side. But um, when he gets to New York, um, this last, the lovely Suzanne Evans, it was, she was a, a well-known actress in New York, Australia, from Walhalla in New South Wales. And um, although well-known to New Yorkers on Broadway, um, Wilkins had no idea who she was. And she didn't know much about him. But she was wheeled out to show him around New York. And uh, she, had, she found him rather um, taciturn. He didn't talk too much. And just thought he was a bit, bit weird. <laughs> so um, he um, obviously was a bit smitten because he said later, oh, can I call you? And she said, oh, yeah, call me at midnight. And he said, oh, <laughs> sounds good. Um, that looks like a good thing. Uh, he didn't realise that she was an actress and didn't feel, finish work until midnight. So, so they ended up going out and dancing and, and he, she said, oh, he's a pretty good dancer. How, how the hell did you have time to learn how to dance? you all over the world doing all this exploration stuff. So she obviously found out a bit more about him since then. So, oh, well, since I 
spoke to you earlier today, I thought I'd better go and get some lessons. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. Well, that's the story. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we're back to Antarctica now. Randolph Hearst now was the guy to provide the money. He'd run out of favour with the Detroit boys, so Randolph Hearst said, oh yeah, um, I'll put the money up. So this is for the 1928 Antarctica one. This time they had two aircraft. Um, Hearst bought him a couple of... Um, um, these, these are Vegas, stuck with a Vegan. And so this is one being towed back after it fell off and fell through the ice. And uh, one was San Francisco, one was Los Angeles. And with these aircraft, he was the first to actually fly in Antarctica. And they surveyed a whole lot of the peninsula and other, other little excursions they did there. That hadn't been done before, so he had to experiment again with landing gear and um, with uh, getting enough supplies, getting fuel supplies to get the range. So another first from Wilkins was the uh, balloon flight, the Graf Zeppelin. Uh, he was pretty well known by now, he's invited on this trip around uh, New York, from New York. Actually went from Germany, because it's a German aircraft, they had to get Germany to New York to officially start the circumnavigation. So they did a whole lot of uh, around the world. And he gets back there and, and there's a, um, another ticker tape parade. So he gets two ticker tape parades. <laughs> He's not, much, he's not really much into this sort of thing, so he um, pretty much declined and went off to attend to what he called private business, which of course was the lovely Suzanne Evans. <laughs> and they did get married and uh, apparently had a long and happy marriage, but they didn't see much of each other. You know, they spent most of the time apart, each with happy, happily doing their separate careers, and they had no children. The Nautilus is another story which I need to spend a lot of time on, but there's a, there's a YouTube clip on this um, by um, Sam Neill, that's right. Sam Neill did a documentary of this particular expedition. What he did, he, he bought an American submarine, ex-Navy from the First World War, pretty basic, rough sort of affair it was, and he um, adapted it and decided to, he could take it under the ice. And he published that in, in his account in 1931. But at one stage it was called like a suicide mission and it was almost mutiny that the crew wanted to bail out because um, they thought they were all going to die for sure um, because they found that there were no dive planes at the end so something went wrong there. W Wilkins did have a habit when things went wrong of saying someone sabotaged him. He did, in his record it comes up a few times either the wires were snipped or that something happened. No, who knows. In this case, the dive planes were sabotaged because he felt the crew really didn't want to go, so, you know, we can't go without dive planes. Well, yes, you can. What he did, he said, no, we've got to go. So he changed the ballast on the submarine so it was nose down. He just charged under the ice and got under the ice <laughs> just so he'd say he could do it. And he got some information under there, getting current information, he's still measuring and getting data. And um, everyone's petrified and he, even Wilkins at that point thought, well, I'm not going to go very far here, and he did back out. But um, he claims to be the first to take a submarine under the ice, which is important later on in his life when, when the nuclear submarines actually did that. So it's quite a, an account. Um, and uh, he got, I, th I think, got pretty bad press after that because a lot of the press were saying he was not looking after his men, he was taking too many risks and perhaps not, um, what you might say, looking after health and safety <laughs> as we do these days, not, not taking due care. So he did get a bit of bad publicity for that, particularly I suppose that the fact that it didn't really succeed in doing what he wanted to do and get, get under the pole, which was pretty ambitious I've got to say. And, um, yeah, so no dive planes, who knows. So back to the Antarctic, this is Ellsworth. He was another rich uh, adventurer and um, wanted, because he was a bit of a flyer, but not much of one, but he recognised that Wilkins could help him. 
So um, he used Wilkins experience in navigation, flying and knowledge of aircraft and knowledge of the ice to get him to fly across Antarctica. That was his goal. And they went down there three years in a row. Um, this is on the White Herb, this one a converted ship. They, in this time the, the Pol Polar Star, a Northrop aircraft, quite a nice looking aircraft, was used. And it fell in the water as well, they had to pull it out. Um, because, you know, the ice is a bit unpredictable. The change of seasons there, it's um, very difficult to know how, how much ice you've got underneath you. Um, but they did develop a runway um, at Deception Island. Anyone been to Deception Island, you'll know that it's a, it's a pretty un unhospitable place to try and take off from. Um, and this is not on the, on the water, this is from the land. They had to build a, a runway at Deception. And uh, I can't imagine where you did it. Like they said they did build one. Um, and I've been there, I cannot imagine where it would be. But on the beach, apparently, they built this. They crushed up some rocks and sand and they built this runway. And they described it as being like a dog's leg with a hump in it. So you had to sort of do a left, do a right, go over the hump and up, and you, maybe you, you got away. It was a pretty awkward sort of runway, apparently. But they, they did it and used it. So um, there was interruption there. Um, if you notice back there, there was uh, three years, wasn't there? 34, 35, 35, 36. And they jumped 37, 38. What happened? Well, that was because the Russians lost their famous flyer, Levinitsky. Um, this was a flyer a bit like Lindbergh was to the Americans. Um, he was like Russia's Lindbergh, and to think of him being lost in the Arctic was a pretty severe blow to the Russians. And probably not surprisingly, the Russians didn't announce anything that was wrong for quite a number of weeks. They assumed that it'd be okay, and um, perhaps the reluctance to let the world know that they'd stuffed up. No? Who would have thought? Uh, but this was a big, very big aircraft for the time, a Tupolev, and um, it was designed to fly from Moscow to New York with a crew, and it was never seen again. But um, Wilkins being the go-to man, anything like this happened at the time, you get Wilkins. So he, he was um, provided with some Catalinas, and they flew sorties out across the ice for seven months trying to look for him. Never found him, and he's still not been found. That, that aircraft has never been found. A twin engine Catalina they used. So, what's next? Getting on the Second World War period, um, Wilkins was um, involved with the Americans in the war as a consultant and on special missions. So, take that as like, that would be like a spy, if you like. Uh, there's not much record of what he actually did. Um, but we do have from his records and his archives his number, uh, the OSS number, 59 with the Americans. That's the, um, the precursor of the CIA. Uh, it's not the Secret Service, but the um, whatever it stands for, I don't know. But he worked for them and others have to told us that he spent a lot of time in China during the war, in Japan during the war, uh, Indonesia, uh, undercover and uh, so on. So he got around a bit and he's highly valued by the Americans. Not so much by Australians. Also he became a consultant in cold climate survival, clothing, rations, methods of surviving in, in the cold. And getting back to the, uh, the submarine story, Commander Calvert was the commander of Escape, one of the first nuclear submarines. And they were going under the ice in 1958. Uh, there was the Nautilus, that was the first of the, they named after the same, same name that, that Wilkins used, the Nautilus. And the, the pair of the submarines was the Skate and the Nautilus. So here's Commander Calvert with, with uh, Wilkins, and he um, was asked to go on board just before they did the attempt. So Wilkins went up to Alaska and went on board the Skate just before they did the attempt. Didn't go with him, of course, but he um, was invited. Because Commander uh, Calvert there, he respected a lot of the work that 
Wilkins have done, particularly with the current work, and he actually used some of the charts and the current data that um, Wilkins had collected when he was there. Because when, when you're under the ice, you don't have much navigational control from the stars or GPS or anything like that. So there's the skate coming through the ice at the North Pole. And uh, so Wilkins' legacy, you could say, is uh, not very much around the place. But Wilkins Sound, we've, we know Wilkins Sound in uh, Antarctica. There is a Wilkins Ice Sheet. But not many of the, these things were named by the Americans, not by the Australians. Those things that... He's got a test chamber in Massachusetts named after him. Because he had a farm there. Actually, Suzanne bought him this farm. Um, uh, and she thought this would be the ideal place when he... The occasions that he did get back to America, this was a nice little farm out in the woods in northern Massachusetts. It was pretty run down, but it was in the woods and it was ideal for a getaway place to get away from the press and get away from everybody. We now, we now have the runway just out of Casey, um, named after him, but there's not much other recognition. Much more recognition very recently since he's had more publicity. So, um, and did he have a few regrets? I guess he did. But the polar weather stations, that was the whole driver for what he was doing all this time. And did he get them? I don't know. He certainly had a go. Each time he went to Antarctica, it was at the, um, it was under the thumb of uh, a financier or a, a news agency or something. They had to do what the, what the money men told them to do, pretty much. So he did make an attempt to set up some bases. Uh, any chance he had, he'd get out there and drop uh, supplies and fuel um, at various locations. But um, of course, it does hundreds of stations there now, weather stations, and uh, so he probably might have had some regrets. But anyway.